So um, for this big idea, this continues on with matter, um, but even more specifically, we're going to look at bonding and phases. So this will look at types of bonding, so like ionic, covalent, and then there will be some questions. We'll do some sample questions on like multiple or multiple choice on um, Vesper and shapes and like hybridization. So we might not get a lot into that today, but we will spend a little bit of time in class reviewing that as well. So. The first uh, slide shows properties based on your types of bonding. So if you remember um, all these different types, so there's ionic, there's covalent, network covalent, and metallic. So just some difference between the types just to kind of review. So ionic, remember you have a metal and a non-metal, um, and they're held together with electrostatic forces. So ionic compounds are the ones that are held together and discussed using Coulomb's law. So the bigger the ions, the less tightly they're held together. Um, the higher the charge, the more they're attracted, so the, the harder they're, or the more difficult it is to take apart. And then you have uh, simple covalent. So those are just your normal covalent compounds, all nonmetals, CO2, I2, H2O, right? Um, nitrogen gas, right? That's just all covalent. And then these network covalent, these are really just two. You have SiO2, so you have uh, compounds with uh, silicon in it, and you have compounds, um, or not even compounds, but elemental carbon. So carbon can be diamond, carbon can be graphite. Um, so really these are the only two examples of network covalent. But the network covalent, the difference is that you have like a lattice of covalent bonds all held together and that's what makes the network covalent so strong. That's why diamond is so strong. Um, and then you have metallic bonding. And so metallic bonding is just metals. So if you have iron, it's metallic bonding. Um, metallic bonding we typically think of when we um, look at sea of electrons. So, and we're gonna look at each one of these in a little more detail, but this just shows some examples. It shows the properties really. So um, melting and boiling points, what their normal state is if you're at standard conditions. Does the solid conduct? Does the liquid conduct? And is it soluble? So there's this virtual lab on here. So if you want to look at um, the different properties of the, the types of bonding, you can go to this virtual lab. There's these videos over here. Um, but then, you know, this says not all ionic compounds are soluble, but if you remember those four solubility rules, potassium, nitrate, ammonium, and sodium, um, are soluble and it says typically halogens, but you don't even have to know that for the AP test. So this just shows the different properties. So, you know, if I tell you um, that you have a beaker full of NaCl, you should be able to tell me that it has a high uh, melting point because it's ionic. Those are the types of questions with this. So here's a, a practice multiple choice. Which of the following substances will be least soluble in water at room temperature? So this kind of ties in with intermolecular forces as well. But if we look at this, right, least soluble, so you want to look at the one that is most uh, different from water. So we know that anything with potassium and nitrate is automatically soluble. Then we have these three. Um, so which of these three, B, C, or D, is most different from water? D. Right, so D is going to be our answer for this one because these B and C hydrogen bond, we're going to look more at actually intermolecular forces are part of this big idea. Uh, D is all dispersion, and so the, that's the most different from water, and so that's not going to be very soluble. Um, part of this big idea also deals with acid strength, which is kind of weird that this is really the only um, acid like learning objective in this entire big idea, but it ties more in with um, types of bonding and it looks at electrons. And so if you remember um, an oxy acid strength, so an oxy acid is any acid with oxygen, um, it increases as you add more O's. So the more O's you have, the stronger the acid. Because when you think about strength of acid, you have to think about how easily it is to take off the H. Because in acid, the stronger the acid, the easier it is to take the H away. And so when you look at this picture, when you have, you know, in this case, you have four O's, 
all four of these O's are pretty electronegative, so they're going to pull the electrons all toward the left side here not really leaving much for the hydrogen, and so the hydrogen is easier to take away. The easier the hydrogen is to take away, um, the stronger the acid. So like HClO4 is a much stronger acid than HClO. Uh, when you're looking at binary acids, that's just typically if you have two atoms, so bi is two, so like HF, HCl, HBr. Um, this ties into looking at uh, the strength of the bond here. So the stronger the bond, the weaker the acid. So again, the stronger the bond, the weaker the acid because you want the H to be able to be removed easily. So like here, if we look at HI, if you think about the size, I is really big. And so the nucleus of the iodine um, doesn't hold on to that hydrogen. It's not as attracted to that hydrogen as fluorine. Fluorine is much, much smaller. And so, um, because fluorine is a lot smaller, the nucleus is more attracted to the hydrogen, and so it makes it harder to take that H away. So you can see um, that as you decrease the bond strength, you increase the acidity. So then here, uh, which of the following would be the weakest acid? So this kind of ties both of these pictures in, um, because the weakest acid first is the one that has the less O's. So the least number of O's is going to be a weak acid. So that's going to eliminate A and C. So really we're between B and D. And so what we need to look at is which of these, which um, atoms, Cl or Br, would have a weaker bond. So think about which one is the bigger atom, because the bigger the atom, the weaker the bond. And so if we look at it, uh, what? so Br is the bigger atom, so it's going to be the weaker bond between H and O. So HBrO2 is actually um, the weakest acid here. Okay, so then looking at solids, liquids, and gases, and some of these we won't spend much time on because we've kind of talked about it a lot. So the biggest thing with this slide is, notice the learning objective says you should be able to use uh, particulate models, so particle diagrams. So solids are really closely packed together. Liquids have a little bit of distance. Gases are super far apart. So if you're given a particle diagram, make sure that you, know, you can tell the difference between the solid, the liquid, and the gas. Uh, kinetic molecular theory. So if you remember, that's when we did that uh, demonstration on the floor with this tape, uh, when you acted as gas molecules. So kinetic molecular theory just explains how gases should behave. Really, you're thinking about how ideal gases should behave. So you should have gas molecules really far apart. Um, if they bounce off of one another, you're not losing any energy. And there's no interaction between the molecules. And that's kind of the biggest thing. You do not want to have any interaction between the gas molecules. The more interactions that you have, the less ideal that it is. Um, and then this first bullet point is probably the most important bullet point because this is a question that I do not want you to miss points on. Average kinetic energy is based on temperature. If all of the gases, no matter what, are at the same temperature, they all have the same average kinetic energy. So if you have a gas that's, you know, H2O2 and, you know, Cl2, those all have very different masses, but in terms of average kinetic energy, if they are all at the same temperature, they're going to have the same average kinetic energy. Uh, and then all gases begin to act non-ideally, so they begin to be more real, when they are at low temps and high pressures. So if you want to look at where gases behave like the least ideal, you want to look for low temperatures and high pressures because that's when you start to increase the interactions between the gases. And so you want... So non-ideal is low temps and high pressures, and then it's going to switch if you want the most ideal. The most ideal, they're moving really fast, not having much interaction, so you would have high temperature and low pressure. Um, and then under the same conditions, the stronger uh, the IMFs, the less ideal they, they become. Because ideal behavior all comes back to how are they interacting. You do not want gas molecules interacting with each other. Um, so least ideal, low temp, high pressure. Uh, most ideal would be 
high temp, low pressure. Okay, so then uh, this would be like a multiple choice. Which combination of conditions of pressure, temperature, and moles respectively are the most ideal? So remember, the most ideal is when there are not very many interactions between the gas molecules. So you want them moving... You want them moving really fast, um, but not interacting. So the fewer interactions, the fewer collisions, the better. So if you want most ideal, you want fast moving. So motion would be based on which of these variables? Temperature. So you want them moving really fast. So what do you want um, to be true of temperature? High. high temp. Okay, so that gets rid of B and C. So we want high temp. And we don't want many collisions between them. Now, if you notice, A and D both are low pressure. So if we want fewer collisions, what should that mean about moles? Low. Yep. So most ideal is going to be low pressure, high temperature, and low number of moles. Most ideal is the less number of interactions between gas molecules. So then looking at gases, um, you don't have to worry about Boyle's Law, Charles' Law, Avogadro's Law. Um, what you need to understand are the relationships between them. So that's actually where this box on the floor, and it's still, the tape is still on the floor. Um, but when we, you know, went from a large volume to a small volume, what happened to the pressure? Or when we increased the temperature, what happened to the pressure? Those are the kinds of, of relationships that you want to know. And if you know the combined gas law, so if you know... P1 V1 over T1 equals P2 V2 over T2. Anything that remains constant, you can cross out. And then you can solve. Typically, if you have to solve a gas problem, you will be using Pivner. These types of questions will be your multiple choice, right? Where they might show you these particle diagrams and say, if you decrease pressure, uh, what's going to happen to volume or something like that. So then this says, use the kinetic molecular theory to predict what would happen to a closed sample of a gas whose temperature increased while its volume decreased. So closed sample just means that gas can't escape. So if you increase the temperature and decrease the volume, what's going to happen? Pressure's increasing. All right, so let's just kind of go through these uh, options, too. Average kinetic energy would decrease. Well, average kinetic energy is based on what? Temperature. temperature. If temperature goes up, kinetic energy should go up. Um, moles can't change because it's a closed sample, so then we just have to look at pressure. Not only are you increasing temperature and increasing number of collisions, but you're also decreasing the volume. So that's compacting all of the gas molecules even closer together. Okay, so ideal gas law. Um, Pivner is on your equation sheet. And you're given um, all of the uh, ideal gas law constants on your equation sheet. So you just have to be able to use them. Um, with the ideal gas law, just keep in mind that you can um, switch in and out different variables. So like moles over liters would be concentration. Um, Moles is also the same as your mass over your molar mass, so you can switch stuff around there, um, or even density. So just keep in mind that you could switch stuff in and out. So this multiple choice question, and notice it doesn't actually have you do the math. It just sets it up for you. So 15.5 grams of an unknown substance, so it's giving you a mass, not a molar mass, but just a sample mass. It's placed in a sealed 5-liter container at 150 degrees Celsius. Uh, the substance is fully converted to a gas, and the pressure in the container is 1.1 atm, which of the following equations represents the molar mass of the unknown compound. So really, instead of having you know, PV equals nRT, now we actually just need to switch our number of moles out for, some, for something else. So normally... So PV equals nRT. If you're given a sample mass, how do you find the number of moles? Mm 
divided by the molar mass. So our N can actually be our mass divided by our molar mass. And if we plug this in, so pressure times volume equals the sample mass over the molar mass times R times T, this actually allows us to calculate molar mass. Because how would I get molar mass on a side by itself? If it's on the bottom. Multiply it over and then divide by PV. So the molar mass equals the sample mass times R times T all divided by P times V. And then you can actually plug in all of the numbers that they give us. So the sample mass was 15.5. R, they use 0.0821 in this. Temperature, don't forget for gases, temperature has to be in Kelvin. Check your units of R just to make sure. And then pressure over um, volume. Or pressure over pressure times volume. So that you're just kind of plugging everything in. Um, to find this answer. And typically the ideal gas law you're probably going to use uh, in free response questions. So they'll ask you to calculate an initial pressure or they'll ask you to calculate the pressure of a gas. You'll probably use the ideal gas law. Um, chromatography, so this is another learning objective within this big idea because this deals with intermolecular forces. So um, chromatography is just a way for us to separate a solution. Typically it's used to separate ink. And so with chromatography, um, you have, this shows paper chromatography. So you're putting a piece of paper into a solution. So sometimes it's water, sometimes uh, maybe it's a nonpolar solvent. But usually you're going to put it into some sort of solvent. And then this um, liquid, the solvent's going to move up the paper. And as it moves up the paper, it's going to take uh, the pigments with it. So it lets us separate everything into different um, components. And so with chromatography, it's all based on, in, on intermolecular forces. So if this is showing us, um, you know, water, if you remember like dissolves like, don't use that in a free response question, but we can use that as we just kind of think through. So the more polar something is, the more attracted it's going to be to another polar um, substance. And then this also actually breaks down, um, you know, chromatography even more to show that the paper is made of cellulose. And so things that are more polar um, are actually going to hydrogen bond to the paper and be more attracted to it. Things that are nonpolar uh, will move up keep the paper even more. Um, so then looking at um, dissociation or looking at dissolving, making a solution, looking at the solute versus the solvent. So solute's what you dissolve, solvent is what does the dissolving. And so when you're drawing the solute dissolving into the solvent, typically your solvent will be water. A couple kind of key points to help you uh, and to make sure that you're not missing any points. Pay attention to the size. So remember, cations are smaller, anions are larger. So when you're drawing, in this case, NaCl, Na plus is actually smaller than Cl minus. Ionic compounds, is, ionic compounds are made of ions. They have full charges, so it's Na plus and Cl minus. Um, so you draw the charges on the ions, but not water. Water is not ionic. Now you can show the partial charges, like water, or oxygen is partially negative, hydrogen is partially positive, but don't show full charges. Sometimes they take points off if you show full charges. Um, this is draw at least three water molecules around each. It all depends on what the problem tells you. If it says to only use six um, molecules of water, then do three and three. If it says to use 10, I would do five and five. Um, and then remember, the negative is going to point toward the positive Na, the positive part of water is going to point towards Cl minus. And this actually shows, these are your ion dipole uh, intermolecular forces. So I know that this one you had on a test, uh, I think last semester. So in this box, a complete um, or complete a particle representation that includes four water molecules with proper orientation around the Ca2 plus ion. So it says represent your water like this. Here's Ca2+, so you have to figure out 
which part of the water is going to be attracted to the Ca2 plus. If it says to include four water molecules, include four. Um, and this, you got a point for just drawing it with your oxygen pointing towards the Ca. You don't have to show any interaction, you just show the O pointing towards the Ca, and you got the points for it. Okay, so then kind of continuing with these particle views, um, this, they haven't asked these questions yet, so they probably will soon, but this looks at calculating molarity um, based on the particle diagram. And so this would be a sample question. It says, rank the six solutions above in order of increasing molarity. Pay attention to volume, and some have equal concentrations. So how do you calculate molarity? Moles over liters. Okay, so these particles in these particle diagrams represent our moles. So in this case, we'll just look at a very general um, case for A. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight particles in 50 milliliters of water. Now I know I'm not converting to liters, but we don't have a calculator right now, so we're just going to make do. All right, so eight over 50. Now if we wanted to, sure, we could simplify and make it easier for us. So let's see, what is that? Four over 25. All right, so A has a molarity. We're just going to say four over 25. B, let's count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So 12 over 50. So 6 over 25. Okay, I'm going to have to write this down. So this one we had 8 over 50, which was 4 over 25. B, we had 12 over 50, which was 6 over 25. All I'm doing is counting my number of particles and putting it over the volume. What would we have for C? Yeah, 2 over 25. And the reason that I'm simplifying if possible is because that way it'll make it easier for us. Now, in case of part D, you have 1, 2, 3, 4 moles over 50. So again, that's 2 over 25. And then what about E? 2 over 25. And then 4 over 25. So this just lets us compare now. So let's see. We want to put it in order of increasing molarity. So we want least to most. So which of these has the most moles in the volume? B. You have six moles in 25 milliliters. So B would have, B would be the most concentrated. Um, is there, well, let's see, which ones would be the least? Right, so C, D, and E are all the least. So I'm going to put C equals D, which equals E. These are the least. And then we have, the other two are in the middle, right? A and F. A equals F, and B is the most. So that's just looking at the particle diagrams. If you're just looking at moles, you're looking at liters. Okay, um, and then this is just saying, you know, some food for thought. If you're looking at these and they don't give you the volume, then assume that they're all in the same volume. Okay, so then looking at distillation, this still goes with um, intermolecular forces and separating your mixtures. So distillation allows you to separate um, a homogeneous mixture based on boiling point. So for example, this distillation setup shows a water and ethanol solution. Water is a clear liquid, ethanol is a clear liquid. It lets us separate two clear liquids from each other. But it's based on boiling point. So it all comes back to intermolecular forces. The weaker the intermolecular forces, the easier it is to boil. And when you're going through, if you need to write out your thought process, then do that because I still have to sometimes. So um, this says in this diagram, ethanol has the lower intermolecular forces. Ethanol is predominantly dispersion with one hydrogen bond, where water only hydrogen bonds. I mean, everything has dispersion, but water has two hydrogen bonds. And so ethanol can actually be heated, vaporized, and condensed more easily. So the first step in any distillation is you heat up 
the mixture. And then what's going to happen is the ethanol condenses right up here. It comes down because this is blocked. This is a stopper. So then it's going to come into the condensation tube. You're running cold water around this tube. So as it cools back down, it's going to condense back into the liquid and it's going to come down into the beaker. So then we've collected the ethanol and now in here we have water. And if we want to make sure that the water is extremely pure, then we can do the same thing with water. So we can evaporate the water, it comes up, we put it through the condensation tube, it condenses, it comes back down into water, and then any impurities would still be in this flask. So um, notice this says down here, ethanol can hydrogen bond like water, but um, ethanol is kind of half dispersion forces, uh, which gives it a lower boiling point. Okay, so then which of the following would have the highest boiling point? So now we're getting into intermolecular forces. Um, with intermolecular forces, if you remember, dispersion forces are the weakest. So dispersion forces are the weakest intermolecular force, and they occur between all molecules. All molecules have dispersion forces. But what we have to look at, and this is the probably the most missed concept with dispersion, is electrons are what we base dispersion forces off of, not mass. Now obviously the higher the mass, the more electrons, but when you're answering a question about dispersion, you have to talk about electrons affecting polarizability. Those are those key words. The more electrons, the more polarizable it is. That means it's easier uh, for the electrons to be moved when you have more of them. And so the more polarizable, actually the stronger the dispersion force. So as you're thinking about dispersion forces, um, this is which of the following would have the highest boiling point. So that means highest boiling point is strongest intermolecular force. So we want to know which of these would have the strongest IMF. Well, they all are dispersion. So the strongest dispersion force is the one with the most electrons. So which of these four options has the most electrons? Okay, so xenon. Okay, so um, in all of these, the only forces are the dispersion, and the strength of the dispersion forces are determined by the polarizability, greater number of electrons. This answer is super important. With increased number of electrons, it becomes more polarizable, not with mass. Okay, and this just kind of shows the difference. So like helium has a really low boiling point because it has very few electrons. Radon has a higher boiling point because it has more electrons. Okay, so this comes back to deviations from ideal gas behavior, this next learning objective, um, because it's you're thinking about intermolecular forces. So at which values of temperature and pressure will N2 behave least like an ideal gas? So that's when we want the most interactions between the two. So we want the most number of collisions between the two, um, but we want them moving more slowly. Because when they're moving slowly and they have lots of interactions, when they collide, they're much more likely to actually interact and not just bounce off of one another. So when we're looking at least like an ideal gas, we want low temperature and high pressure. So which of the options gives us a low temp and a high pressure? A. Okay, so um, when a gas is at a low temp, high pressure, um, you're going to have more interactions between them. And if you watch any of these videos, sometimes they talk about van der Waals forces. Um, that's the same thing as dispersion. We're not concerned with van der Waals forces. That's a, that's a combination of different IMFs. Okay, so hydrogen bonding. Um, for some reason, one of the learning objectives is that you're able to describe the relationship between the structural features like in biological molecules, like DNA. So more than likely, they're going to ask a multiple choice question about showing hydrogen bonding in DNA. So we put that picture on here. So hydrogen bonding is seen in like water, DNA, ammonia, HF, any alcohols which have OH groups. Um, the biggest thing is that you have to have hydrogen in the same molecule with NO or F 
as well as an intermolecular attraction with another. So you always need, and this was a good tip, right? We always just remember H and off, but hydrogen just wants to have fun. F-O-N, right? H and F-O-N. So this kind of shows you. So notice there's an OH bonded here. This is an intramolecular. And then the intermolecular force is between these molecules, between this H and this O, which is also bonded to another hydrogen. And then you can see in DNA here, you have um, an N hydrogen bonded to an H, you have an H hydrogen bonded to an O, um, you know, and so on. That's how DNA is held together through hydrogen bonds. That's how we get that double helix because of the hydrogen bonds between them. Okay, so here's another uh, example. Water molecules are depicted in the diagram below along with five arrows that show some kind of interaction between molecules or atoms, which of the following is true. So what we need to look at are uh, what are hydrogen bonds and what are not. So let's see, how many of those arrows point toward a hydrogen bond? Three. Here's a hydrogen bond. It's an intermolecular. Inter means between. So here's a hydrogen bond, hydrogen bond, hydrogen bond. These other two are intra. Those are covalent bonds. Covalent bonds are much stronger than intermolecular forces. Um, and I know that we're going to look at it later, but... Intermolecular forces, hydrogen bonds are what are broken when you boil water. Covalent bonds are not. If you break covalent bonds, you break water up into H2 and O2. That's not what we do. Right? You break the hydrogen bonds and the dispersion forces in order to boil water. So looking back at Coulomb's Law, um, this always comes back to um, how ionic compounds are held together. Um, so ionic compounds are held together using Coulomb's Law, but they also can be dissolved through Coulomb's Law. So you can dissolve ionic compounds in polar solvents like water because of ion dipole forces. That's when you have an ion from an ionic compound um, interacting with a polar molecule. That's the dipole. Um, so it's kind of like a tug of war between them. Um, and then we can predict how soluble something will be using Coulomb's Law. So the smaller the ions, the closer together they are, and the harder it is for them to break apart. So always think about the attraction between the two. So like if you have a cation and an anion, and they're small ions, they're going to be held together much more tightly because the nuclei are closer together. So the smaller the ions, uh, the more attracted they're going to be, and the harder it is to pull them apart, so they're not going to be as soluble in water. Um, same thing with charge. The higher the charge, if you have 2 plus and 2 minus, those are going to be more attracted. Um, and so in this question, it says predict which of the following pairs should be more soluble in water. So let's think about what that means. If it's more soluble in water, that means that it's easy to break the ionic bond. So we want to think about ions that are big, with low charge. So here we're looking at LIF and NAF. So they're both plus one minus one and they're both with fluorine. But what we need to do is we need to compare Li to Na. Which one is bigger? Na. Right? Further down we go the more energy levels and the bigger it is. So Na is bigger so it's less attracted to the fluorine, less attracted to the fluoride ion and it's easier to break apart. So then if we look at NAF and KF, which of those would be more soluble? KF. Because again, K is bigger, so the KF bond is not as strong as the NAF bond. So the easier it is to break that bond, the more soluble it will be in water. And then looking at the last one, we have BEO and we have LIF. Now you might look and you're like, wait a second, like we're not really comparing the same thing. What's the biggest difference between BEO and LIF? 
O has a 2 minus charge. So BEO is plus 2 minus 2, LIF is plus 1 minus 1. The higher the charge, the more attracted they are. So in this case, the ones that have the lower charges are actually um, the easier to break. So it all is going to come back to bonding. Okay, so then looking at solutions, um, like I said before, don't say like dissolves like, because you probably won't get those points. In instead, what you have to do is you have to talk about the intermolecular forces. So if you say water has, um, you know, water hydrogen bonds and contains dipole-dipole forces and dispersion forces and, you know, whatever other polar molecule you want to look at also has dipole-dipole forces, so they interact more through dipole-dipole. Um, you always want to come back to um, the intermolecular forces when you're talking about um, dissolving something in whatever solvent. So this is a free response question from 2013. And so this is use the information to answer parts C and D. So C says dichloromethane has a greater solubility in water than carbon tetrachloride. So this is more soluble than this. And it says account for this observation in terms of the intermolecular forces between each of the solutes and water. So when we're looking at something being soluble in water, and we're dealing with covalent compounds, so we're no longer looking at Coulomb's law. Coulomb's law is always just for ionic compounds. So now we want to look at how the intermolecular forces play. Now notice here how each is underlined. That means that you need to make sure you talk about each of the solutes. So talk about dichloromethane and what um, intermolecular forces it contains and talk about carbon tetrachloride and what intermolecular forces it contains because that's one of the points. This was a free response question. So when you look at this, you want to look at C2 or CH2Cl2. So dichloromethane is polar where CCl4 is not. Now, again, we can think in our head like dissolves like. And it tells us dichloromethane is more soluble in water. We need to explain why. So don't try to like fight it and say, well, no, like carbon tetrachloride is actually more soluble. It already tells us that dichloromethane is more soluble. And that's because it's polar. CCL4 is not. Notice you're talking about both of them. So because dichloromethane has dipole-dipole forces, where CCL4 is only dispersion, um, the dichloromethane is more soluble. All right, so even though, yes, in our head, like dissolves like, in this case, we need to make sure that we talk about each solute and how it interacts with water. And then this looks at vapor pressure. So if you remember, um, vapor pressure is always based on IMFs. Vapor pressure is the pressure that's above a liquid. So the weaker the IMFs, the easier it is to go from liquid to gas. And so the weaker the IMFs, the higher the vapor pressure because it's easier to escape the liquid. Um, and so when you're looking at vapor pressure, you always want to come back to IMFs as well. So then looking at more physical properties, this says which of the following would have the highest vapor pressure at 25 degrees Celsius? So when I'm thinking of highest vapor pressure, I'll automatically write myself a note on what that means. So if I'm thinking of highest vapor pressure... That means that there is uh, lots of gas above the liquid. So that's what vapor pressure tells me is the, the gas above the liquid. If it's a high pressure, that means there's a lot of gas, which means if there's a lot of gas, the liquid escapes easily. And so what would that mean about intermolecular forces of the liquid? Mm -hmm. They're weaker. And this, like even before you look at the options, if you write out your thought process, that's going to actually help make the question itself a little bit easier. And so when you're looking at this, you want weak IMFs. So we want to look here at the different types of intermolecular forces and kind of their strength. So water, what's the strongest IMF in water? Okay, hydrogen bonds, that's strong, so that's going to be out. And then B, C, and D all have the same main um, IMF, which would be what? Dispersion. 
And then when you were looking at strength of dispersion forces, what should we be focusing on? Not mass, but yes. electrons. So the more electrons, the stronger the dispersion force. So C10H22, that has a lot of electrons. So I'm just going to cross that one out. So now we're between mercury and CCl4. Well, if we actually look at the number of electrons, mercury is way down at the bottom of the periodic table, like atomic number 80. So it has 80 electrons, where CCl4 does not. It has, well, maybe. Let me think. Oh, wait. No, I'm silly. This is a metal. HG's metallic bonding. So me. Um, and so our answer here is CCl4. All right, metallic is even stronger up there. C of electrons. So we want to always look at dispersion forces. So highest vapor pressure is the one with the weakest IMF. If you are comparing dispersion, the more electrons there is, the stronger um, the IMF is going to be. And so this just shows you dipole moments. You don't have to calculate dipole moments, but this just shows how, if you think about a tug of war, they all cancel out. So then looking uh, quickly at electronegativity, um, if you remember difference in electronegativity, the further apart they are on the periodic table, the more polar the, mo or the, more polar the bond. So if they're right next to each other on the periodic table, they're not going to be as polar as if you're looking at like H and F, right? Or L, I, and F, which L, I, and F is ionic. But like H and F is really far apart. Even H and O, those are pretty polar bonds. So this, which bond has the most ionic character? So we want to look at which one of these is furthest apart on the periodic table. And you can even see right behind here if you want to actually calculate the values. What's the most electronegative atom you can have? F. Right, so typically if you have an ionic compound with fluorine in it, it's probably going to be the most ionic. Okay, so then this one, which of the following bonds would be the most polar? So you want to look at which one of these are the furthest apart on the periodic table. Yep, HF. Right, HF is typically pretty polar. Um, if you remember, CH bonds are nonpolar. Um, and then if you're looking at everything else, the furthest apart, the more polar. So now coming back to types of substances, why they didn't put all these learning objectives together, I don't know. But this looks at ionic. So um, if you remember, ionic solids are held together in a crystal lattice. So the ionic solids themselves are held together in a crystal lattice, uh, which looks like this picture. So you have ions that alternate. So you have positive negative ions. And so this picture on the left here actually shows what your crystal lattice would look like. Um, ionic compounds are very brittle. So what that means is if you hit an ionic compound or you drop it on the floor, um, it actually will break. And that's because if you, so let's say you hit the ionic, the crystal lattice right here, that means that the ions will move. And when they move, because you have oppositely charged ions, they actually will repel and it will break the solid. So they're very brittle. Um, if you remember, um, as we looked at ionic substances before, this always comes back to Coulomb's law as well. So if you're looking at how attracted something is, um, the greater the charge, the more attracted they are. Uh, and the smaller the ions, the more attracted they are. Um, and then something else with ionic substances, they conduct as liquids and solutions, but not as solids. So if you have like an unknown solid and you want to figure out if it's ionic or not, test the conductivity as a solid and then put it in solution and test the conductivity. If it doesn't conduct as a solid but it conducts as a solution, it's probably ionic. Um, and then ionic substances always come back to lattice energy, which is based 
on Coulomb's law again. So the more lattice energy, that means the harder it is to break it. Um, and the harder it is to break, the higher the melting point or the boiling point. So here'd be a multiple choice. Um, which of the following statements regarding the above ionic solids is true? So here, picture one, we have smaller ions, so they're closer together. Picture two, they're bigger. So this says they're malleable, ductile, substance one has a higher boiling point, substance two, bless you, has a higher boiling point. So ionic, this says that they're ionic solids. Ionic solids are not malleable and are not ductile. That means that you can bend it, you can pull it into a wire. Ionic compounds are brittle. They break very easily. So malleability and ductility only describe metallic compounds, not ionic. So then let's look at boiling point. Which of these have ions that are more attracted to each other? Yeah, this first one, they're more attracted to each other because they're smaller. So if they're more attracted, that means it's harder to break. And if it's harder to break, what does that mean about boiling point? It's higher. Okay, so that means statement three is going to be true. Substance one is going to have the higher boiling point. Okay, so the metallic properties. So metallic solids like copper, iron, those are malleable and ductile. And the reason that they're malleable and that they're ductile are because these sea of electrons. The sea of electrons just means that electrons are very mobile between all of the, the metal atoms. And this is a pretty good analogy of golf balls in a bathtub. Right, so imagine filling your bathtub with golf balls. You fill it all the way up to the top. Um, they're going to arrange themselves to fill the space. But then if you fill it with water, the water actually fills in all the holes between the golf balls. That's like a sea of electrons. The water acts as the electrons, and it fills in all the space. And then the golf balls themselves are the metal atoms. That's what allows metals to conduct so well. That's why we use wire made of copper because copper has a lot of sea of electrons. You can bend it. The copper wire is ductile, so you can bend it. It's malleable, so it like, you know, bends very easily. And the sea of electrons allow it to conduct electricity. The more electrons, the more it conducts, right? The more charge you have moving around, the more it conducts. So this says, which of the following metallic properties is best explained by the sea of electrons model of metals? So which of these can we explain based on sea of electrons? Yeah, conductivity, right? More electrons, more conductive. All right, so now we get into some of the shapes. We're not spending time reviewing the shapes right now, um, but you can look back in your notes if you need to. So hybridization, if you remember, is based on the number of electrons around your central atom. So in this case, you have oxygen around the central atom, and you want to look at areas of electrons. So I have one, two, three, four areas of electrons around my central. And if you remember, one, two, three, four, that's S, P, P, P. So you have three P orbitals. You have one S orbital. You have three P orbitals. You have five Ds. All right, so one, two, three, four, S, P, 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 that's S, P, three. If you remember, the exponents should add up to equal your areas of electrons around your central. Okay, which of the following molecules has polar bonds but is a nonpolar molecule? So this looks back at electronegativity. You might have to draw them out. If you're asked questions like this, you'll probably have to actually draw them out and look. Um, but if you want to look at it being nonpolar, what, sh what could we look at when we look at uh, something being a nonpolar molecule? Symmetry. symmetry. All right, if it's symmetric, it's probably going to be nonpolar. Typically, if you have four of the same atom around the central, it's nonpolar. Like E. All right, those CCL bonds are polar because they're pretty far apart on the periodic table, but they all pull evenly. And if I put like a $5 bill between four people, they're all going to pull evenly, makes it nonpolar. And then which of the following has a tetrahedral shape? So then you have to draw them out. Think about what it means to be tetrahedral. That means you have four atoms bonded around your central, zero lone pairs. 
which would be which of these? D. Yep. All right, so then this is a question that kind of ties into lab, but I'm not sure how they would ask a question, whether they would make it multiple choice or free response. Um, but one of the learning objectives is to actually design or evaluate a plan to figure out the type of bonding in a sample. So this, if you actually click on this, this is a virtual lab that takes you to bonding type. But really what you can think about is this table right here. This table gives a great summary of the properties. So like melting point, if you had a solid, melt it. See what the melting point is. Is it a low melting point? Is it a high melting point? Um, because if it's a high melting point, it's probably ionic. If it's low, it's probably covalent, unless it's a network covalent. Conductivity. Does it conduct as a solid? No? Okay. What about in solution? Does it conduct in solution? If yes, hey, it could be ionic. So this actually goes through, goes through solubility and then volatility. Volatility is, does it evaporate easily? So then we already talked about the structure of ionic compounds. It exists um, as ions in a crystal lattice. So strength of an ion, ionic bond is related to what have we been talking about over and over and over with ionic bonding? Right, Coulomb's law. So Coulomb's law always looks at the distance between and the charges of the ions, and that's how we can think about ionic compounds. So here's another example. Sodium chloride, magnesium oxide uh, have the same structure. They're both ionic. They have a crystal lattice, but their melting and boiling points are, so NaCl has a lower melting point um, and, and boiling point. So it says explain why the values for magnesium oxide are much higher. So always refer ionic compounds if you're looking at properties back to Coulomb's law. So not only are they smaller in terms of ion size, but they also have higher charges. All right, then alloys. This is something that um, we didn't spend a ton of time on, but there very well could be questions on it. So um, alloys, you have two main types. You have substitutional and you have interstitial. And this shows the pictures of both. Substitutional alloys are when you have atoms of similar size substituted in. So you're just substituting one for another. Sometimes it's just to make things a little cheaper. Um, versus interstitial, which means, remember, inter means between. So interstitial alloy is when you put... Um, usually a smaller non-metal between the metal atoms. Interstitial alloys um, actually help to make the alloy harder, so like less malleable um, and more dense. So if you want to make something really strong like steel, you want it really, really strong, you don't want it to bend, you would use an interstitial alloy because you're plugging in the holes. Just think about, like, if you're plugging the holes with something, it's going to make it a lot harder. So this question says, pure silver is generally considered too soft to form useful objects and is generally alloyed with other metals such as copper and gold. Two alloys of silver were created with equal amounts of silver alloyed with either gold or copper. If the silver-copper alloy is harder than the silver-gold, so silver-copper is harder which means it's less malleable than silver gold, which of the following would best explain the difference? Okay, so we want to think about if silver copper is less malleable, we want to think about what that might mean about the actual um, structure. And so when you have a big difference in size like this, the silver copper, they have different radii. More than likely, this is going to be an interstitial alloy, which means it prevents any of the silver from moving. When you plug those holes, it prevents the alloy or prevents the metal from moving, and it makes the alloy a lot harder. Um, and so the answer for this one will be C. Copper has a smaller radius than silver, 
and it disturbs the structure, making it harder. Disturbs the structure just means it plugs the holes and it doesn't let the structure move. So this is a table that shows um, kind of some definitions of the different types. So substitutional um, versus interstitial. So like steel is an interstitial alloy. Um, typically you use non-metals when you're plugging up the holes uh, because it makes it more rigid, less malleable, and ductile. Um, if you have substitutional alloy, it still is malleable and it still has similar densities, but typically it just makes it cheaper. Okay, this just shows the alloy. Okay, so an example of an alloy is shown in the diagram below. Compared with the pure metal X, how would you expect the properties of the alloy to vary? So, compared to just having X here, What's going to happen when we start to plug some of these holes? What's going to happen to the metal? Is it going to bend as much? No. So it's going to be a lower malleability. And if you think about this being the volume, what are we doing to the mass per volume if we're adding more to the holes? Increasing it. So this, al so this alloy would have a lower malleability and a higher density. Okay, so just some characteristics. Um, metallic solids, whether it's an alloy or not, always has the sea of electrons. That's the big thing for metallic. Sea of electrons for metallic solids. Um, but as we look at metallic solids, we can also, well, and network covalent, we can think about semiconductors. And so we didn't talk a lot about semiconductors except for the two types, N-type and P-type. Think about N meaning negative, P meaning positive. If it's negative, you have more electrons. If it's positive, you have less electrons. So in this question, one type of semiconductor is germanium. Um, adding some impurities. Adding which of the following would create a P-type semiconductor with increased conductivity? So we're comparing this to germanium, to GE. If we want a P-type, we want to add something that has fewer electrons. So... Which of these options have fewer electrons but are still similar in size to germanium? You should have gallium. So when you make a semiconductor, you still want it to be similar, um, but you want it to have fewer electrons. So gallium has fewer electrons but is still similar in size. Um, okay, so the next slide, and it this turned off, but the next slide shows covalent compounds. Um, and so the biggest thing is knowing the difference between network covalent and then just covalent. So remember, network covalent is typically either SiO2 or just carbon. Um, and carbon meaning graphite and diamond. And so... Um, Graphite and diamond are both network covalent, and so they're connected in three-dimensional structures, which add to the strength. That's what makes diamond so strong. Um, versus just molecular compounds. So that's kind of how we can distinguish. Network covalent are the really strong three-dimensional structures. Molecular compounds would be like H2O, right? Um, CH4. Those would be our molecular compounds. Um, and those are the weakest of all of them, right? And then even within the molecular compounds, if we're looking at the forces between them, like water is polar, um, you know, CH4 is nonpolar. So you can have polar covalent and nonpolar covalent. Uh, oh, okay, then the last question. What is broken when water boils? Intermolecular forces, so hydrogen bonds, dipole-dipole, and dispersion. 